everybody's sleeping in. So that's great. My name is Steve Fabiani. I don't know if we need this. My wife and uh, my wife Jane and I own a gallery here, and we want to welcome you. Thank you for coming in. In uh, in 1989, our gallery was privileged to host a show of artwork by Lakota artists Melvin and Sandy Miner. Our gallery has always maintained an interest in the Northern Plains artwork, and through our relationship with Melvin, we are excited to work cooperatively with the Department of Interior Sioux Indian Museum to bring you this show. Melvin will go into detail about the Sioux Museum and the artwork that we have here, as well as other interesting topics. But I wanted to take a second to uh, thank him for this opportunity. You know, take the opportunity to thank him, I should say. Because his traveling partner, Wayne Amiat, was faced with a family emergency and at the last moment was not able to come. He was his companion lecturer. And Melvin, we thank you wherever you're standing. Because we know it was a long drive. He made it by himself. We really thank you. This is just the re uh, beginning of what we hope to be a long-standing relationship with the Sioux Indian Museum. Our goal is to offer the Chicagoland area a fine selection of this wonderful artwork by traditional artists, artists whose work might otherwise not be shown or seen away from their immediate area. So once again, we'd like to thank you for coming, and I'd like to have a warm welcome from Melvin. I would like to first start off by saying um, uh, the definition of Northern Plains uh, to myself and to quite a few other people would be from um, like Kansas or Nebraska all the way up to uh, Canada and then from the Bighorn Mountains all the way back here to say uh, Minnesota and it could come all the way up to uh, Chicago here. You have all those tribes involved in, in that area uh, would be considered Northern Plains. Sioux Falls uh, um, art show that they have in September they also have a definition of Northern Plains and they name off all the tribes that they will accept into their art market. So we, we have been trying to identify uh, Northern Plains as far as the tribes and the artwork. The uh, other definition um, is based upon the buffalo. Everywhere the buffalo might have roamed is considered the Northern Plains also. And uh, my wife and me, we uh, decided to name our, our own little art company, Buffalo Tracks. And basically the philosophy behind that was we wanted to make any item that was, uh, that was dealing with the buffalo, but also any items that the buffalo might have roamed in, in that area. And, and it even involved other tribes. And um, myself, I'm from the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation. That's where my wife's from. It's, uh, a locate, it's located about 130 miles north of the Black Hills in South Dakota. Uh, kind of um, wet or east, south from Rapid City, about 100 miles is the Pine Ridge uh, Reservation. And then right next to that is the Rosebud Sioux Reservation. And we have nine reservations in South Dakota. And North Dakota has, I'm guessing, about six or seven up there. And um, the Shine River, Pine Ridge, and Rosebud have a very large land base. And right now, what I like about it is they're trying to bring the buffalo back on their reservations. And basically what that's going to do is also bring back or enhance the, the craft work, dealing with buffalo items anyhow. We're going to see a lot of bow cases, uh, shields. We're going to see uh, some uh, headdresses, which are, which are very unusual work that's done with the horns of the buffalo. I think those are going to come back to the tools, such as the spoons, the ladles that are made from that. And, and that part's uh, it's kind of uh, yet to see, but I think uh, some of the artists' complaints in the past have been, we cannot get the buffalo skulls, we can't, we can't get the, uh, the, uh, the hides, they're, they're too expensive, and um, now that they're going to be tanning their own hides. And so um, I'm looking forward to that. It's kind of an, an upbeat situation there. I would like to also say that uh, the, um, the sacred pipes that sometimes you, you see on uh, TV or, or everybody has seen one probably, 
the keeper of the first um, sacred pipe is located on our reservation. And, and his name right now is uh, Orville Looking Horse. And that, that pipe, when it first was brought down many years ago, uh, has the standing um, uh, history on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation. And that's, they, they traced it back as far as they could. And they just can't remember certain names and certain families who've had it. But the home is based on our reservation. And, and that's what we're really proud of because uh, other tribes throughout the United States look at us as the keeper of the sacred pipe. And um, it's in a wooden uh, little building. It's on a tripod. It's wrapped in a buffalo hide. There's a lot of sage around it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, gifts and different things to help um, protect it and keep it clean. And so it, about every summer, a lot, uh, quite a few people in hell will go up there to uh, pay some type of respect towards that. I uh, would like to also say that um, we have a, or I do, I have an enrollment number book here of the artists that I've been working with. And the Native Americans, uh, to really be classified as a Native American, uh, you must have an enrollment number. You must be enrolled in a tribe. The uh, gift shop where I work at, in order to sell something for us to label as Native Americans, we must need their enrollment number. This book right here is about half of the enrollment numbers that we have on individuals. And um, it basically states their tribal affiliation, their degree of Indian blood, and um, also uh, the signature of the agent of that reservation. And it's very important to have that these days for the items that, that we are, are buying or selling. We want to make sure if we say they're Indian made, that they are Indian made. In the, in the past, and I would say uh, even up to five years ago and before, um, a non-Indian could say he's Indian and he can sell artwork. And I really have no problem with that just as long as he doesn't say he's Indian. They, they can make the work. Uh, people over in Europe is a good example. They make some, some beautiful Lakota work. And they're not Indian, but they don't, they don't claim to be either. But some people do, and they, they want to make money and they want to sell it as Indian made. So anyhow, the uh, Congress last year passed an amendment, I guess it's been a year or maybe two years now, the uh, Arts and Crafts Act which protects Native Americans um, in, in their art. They don't want nobody to go out there and, and misrepresent the Native Americans when they're dealing with arts. And so, um, anyhow, I have my enrollment number in here and, and all the other artists. And we have another book that we have. And it's good to, um, uh, I guess, it's, it's good to check if somebody wants to sell you, even on the street, something, and they say they're Native American, um, ask for their enrollment number. And everybody should carry it. I've, it's almost like your uh, driver's license. You must carry it, and those people know that um, when they go into a shop, and somebody says, well, I need that enrollment number. Uh, they know it too, as, as Native Americans, and, and they have to produce it. And it's good to hold them to it. A lot of them will say, I'll send it to you or I'll come back. Uh, not unless they really look Indian, I would go ahead and, and tell them to go ahead and get their enrollment number. Or you, the tribe that they claim to be from, you can call that tribe right there on the spot. And that person should not be afraid of doing that. You'll talk to the enrollment uh, division of the tribe. And then what they will do is uh, verify his parents and his uh, give you a, a U number it's called it's an identification number I, that that's also on there but it's really important that that I mention that because uh, you might not buy things out of the shop all the time you might buy it at a powwow you might buy it at a, an arts fair and um, it's good to question them and they should not they, they should not get offended by it because 
they, for the past year and a half, they've probably been asked everywhere they've been about this. And uh, the only ones that really argue is uh, uh, little ladies. They, they really said, geez, I'm Indian and I'm more Indian than you are. Why do I have to come up with this? And I said, well, it's part of our policy. Oh, policies, I've been living by policies all my life and the whole bit, so I, I kind of give in to them. Cause I'm, <laughs> They're sitting there with that purse, and I'm just really afraid of getting hit. And, and um, they're about 80 years old. They don't want to go through none of that no more. But uh, the elderly, I do kind of give a, a, some leeway there. But the younger people, uh, they always have a hard time. They always end up losing it or something. But I tell them I, I need it, and I need it. And one example was um, I had a person come in from uh, Germany um, or Norway or somewhere. He went to buy a sculpture from a guy named Richard uh, Underbaggage. And it was a $700 piece, and we had the deal all worked out, and he said, can I see some um, documentation that this person is Indian, other than the word Underbaggage? And I said, no problem, and I went back, and, uh, and we didn't have it. And I've been de I personally have been dealing with this guy for a year and a half, and he's been dealing with the shop for I don't know how many years. And so we didn't have it, so I missed out on the sale. The guy was leaving early in the morning, and I told him I could get it that night. But I went and seen Richard, and Richard said, nobody's asked me in all the years that I've been there. And, and he just whipped it out, and he had his, he, there's sometimes you either get a large piece of paper or a little tiny uh, driver's license type of style of identification. He says, I have it right here, and I said, well, that, that pretty much cost me seven hundred dollars last yesterday. Anyhow, I could have had that piece sold, and uh, and and we realized it wasn't really none of our faults. But I took it for granted that we've been dealing with this guy that we had him on record, and um, we didn't. So it it is important, especially to Europeans. They want to make a a sale. I mean, uh, they want to buy something right now, and they want to know right now. They don't want to buy something and go overseas and then never hear from you again. And uh, people in the States, we can wait around a little bit for that identification to come along. But I don't want to spend all the talk on that, but I do want to explain to you that the ideal of somebody saying they're Indian or something's Indian made is very important for, the, uh, for that material. Because if you buy something, and, and you definitely want the history of it, and you want to pass it down to your, your children. Um, you don't want it to come up later on, 20 years down the road, that that piece wasn't made by a Native American or by somebody who, who claimed to be somebody else. So it is very important for that. Documentation is really important on uh, any piece that you buy, uh, any kind of artwork, anyhow. And so, try to get as much as you can the very first time that you buy something. Some of these aren't real cl clearly marked, but we can um, write up uh, everything that I know about it in a very short time. Uh, the other thing I would like to say is um, these pieces, like I said, are, are Northern Plains. Um, and basically what's, what's been in this shop that I've seen anyhow have been Southwest work. And the Southwest um, artists have been very successful at marketing uh, their work, the, the jewelry and the pottery and uh, the rugs, uh, just everything. They've been very successful. And, and the Lakota artists, um, they can learn from that. And uh, I think the Southwest have knocked down quite a few doors on proving that Indian uh, products do sell and they are remarkable and and people could be successful in many ways and so the Lakotas really do uh, are or they are looking down the southwest for some direction in marketing and and trying to market their pieces out there we have a few advantages that that I feel we we have and one of them is that we have a great history and we have some chiefs that are very well known, Red Cloud, Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, American Horse, um, Spotted Tail, Chief Gull, 
we've been in some, some fantastic battles or confrontations, uh, some winning, some losing, but they've been documented. A lot of books have been written on us. Some of the movies uh, that have came out, uh, uh, some of them give us justice as far as what we consider it being uh, pretty well accurate. Also now the movies are using our Indian actors. We have a, uh, a, we had a big controversy in South Korea that if there is an Indian movie concerning our people, then our people should be involved in it. Maybe not the leading roles, but the supporting roles are the, the extras. And basically what the last few movies that were made in South Dakota, they wanted uh, props for the movie. And that actually really prompted uh, a lot of artists to get into another field. Cause you, it, and, and their field is kind of, they up front on the, on the, um, the camera, is all the authentic things, but as it goes back, then you get into, like you have a war club, the, the tips are rubber, and then and the beads are like painted on. They're not, they're not real beads and things. So in one sense, you have to ask yourself if you want to get into that type of media. But for the upfront things, there was a, a lot of, of our Indian artists who got to participate in that. And then basically what they can do is they can later on as a marketing tool is, I made some pieces for Dancing with Wolves. And I see them at Little Art Show, somebody will have a, a picture of uh, Kevin Costner and that, and that artist, and he must have took about 100 or 200 pictures. And my, my wife got to take one with him also. But, but you can set that up and say, um, I made some of the weapons or some of the uh, dresses or some. And it does help sell. People want to be part of that experience there. And Kevin Costner was willing to do that. And uh, he realized he wasn't paying that much, so I think he tried to help out in many other ways. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't get paid very much as the extra anyhow, no matter where you're at. But a lot of Indian people got to experience that. Um, and some of them are kind of small-time movie stars around Rapid City. And, and, um, um, there's another movie being going to be filmed called Crazy Horse um, sometime this summer. They just got done filming a movie called Lakota Woman, and uh, that's probably been about three months ago or four months ago, so the editing sh it should be coming out this summer or September, I think, so be watching for that. It's kind of a contemporary movie, but they always have a... Uh, somebody's always going back on a contemporary movie into a dream or a vision and that's where you'll see all the props, the dresses, the war shirts, the war clubs. Somebody's having a vision about something and uh, I think in Thunderheart uh, Val Kilmer kept, kept on seeing this uh, Sundance scene and things and uh, my, my wife was part of the Sundance scene and, but you can never, you can't make them out at all. She, she had a hard time finding her own self in there. And they filmed for like uh, 40 days straight and it was only like about three seconds that they would see this thing and she felt, uh, and all the Indian people really that do these movies feel cheated some way. They said, God, we were out there, it was 90 degrees and we did this day after day and I barely even seen myself in there and so they felt kind of cheated but some of them now have said, I don't want to go through that no more, not unless that could be guaranteed and no producer is going to guarantee, guarantee a, a spot on there. But anyhow, um, going back to the, the movie thing is um, um, that, that, ha that is going to change a little bit of the art market. It's going to put exposure out there to millions of people. The other change that I see is um, Indian casinos. And I don't know how many there is as of today, but they're popping up all the time, and some are quite successful. I've been out to Foxwoods Casino in Connecticut, and um, as of last year, they, they grossed a billion dollars, and that's why Donald Trump is really mad about the whole thing. And, um, but the, the good thing about it was I, I walked through, and there was uh, at least five Indian gift shops. And, um, I, I myself personally represented a teepee shop, so quite a bit of merchandise to them. And then uh, I can 
I, I met one guy at Sioux Falls. I, I didn't meet him at Sioux Falls, but he came back from the Sioux Falls art show. He said that she bought $30,000 from him that day and that she bought out about six or seven tables, meaning the buyer for Foxwood. And so um, they were adding it up and they came up with this large amount of money that she spent in, in one day and that to fill these shops. And, and a good point uh, about that is that there is millions of people who are going to, the, to this casino in particular and they're gonna see all this work. And so it, it is gonna be, um, you're gonna be exposed to it more. I don't know how that's going to affect the other like shop owners uh, who've been in business a long time. The casino business, it, it, the money comes in so rapidly and it's like you can do what, whatever you want to do if you're successful. Up in Minnesota, uh, they're very successful also. Uh, they're going to build a museum, cultural center. This Foxwood is also. Uh, I read this Indian gambling magazine and all of these places are building museums, cultural centers, expanding their gift shops, putting in marketing people, um, spending large amount of dollars on advertisement, the, which will help the artists. And the, but the only bad thing, which is, it, it's commented about a lot of people, especially the elderly, is that anywhere you have a casino sometimes, especially on a reservation, the people don't want to do the arts and crafts. The, the local area, it's too much excitement going on, too much of other, uh, um, <coughs> I'm trying to say, um, distractions. yeah, distractions and to me temptations and, and your life changes just overnight. And, and some people are doing the work, but a lot of them are saying, well, I'll just work for the casino, I'll just, uh, um, they're able to receive some money from the profits if that casino is, is doing good. And so you have a tendency, the artwork, even though it's rewarding, it's, it's long hours, it's, it's a lot of patience, you go through a, you know, quite a bit of, of work you put into it, so if there's another opportunity to jump out of that arena there, then, then you take it. And you might come back to it, but you take it because You've been doing this for five years or ten years, and you realize that you're just barely surviving. And um, and it happens to be the truth all everywhere. And and like I said, the Southwest, there's some artists who are very successful, who have been able to uh, hire other individuals to work, to help them out on a production line. The bad thing about beadwork and coal work, porcupine coal work, is that you really can't mass produce it. It it's, takes a lot of time, and it's hard to find people who are willing to do like the same design over and over. So you have to uh, limit your advertisement. If they're almost one of a, a kind pieces. You just really can't duplicate it. And, and that's good in one sense, but as far as making money as an artist, th that might not uh, work in their benefit. So what they have to do is make unusual pieces, make something that is, is really uh, uh, authentic, but then you run into the production that you're only one person. And, and we always say back there for a Lakota anyhow, it's basically one guy against the world. And let's say you're doing really well and you're beating and you hurt your hand. There has been some families that just said for three months his hand has been um, has been hurt, he hasn't been able to do nothing at all. Um, it, it's a risky business. I've seen women who have had uh, arthritis set in and they just said, now I have to look for another job, even though I, I really love this job right here. And the arthritis just ruined the whole income. All of a sudden they were on top of the world and they were down. We discussed the artist uh, Charles Chief Eagle he made beautiful dolls, and he, he's done a show here, done shows all over the United States. I talked to him several months ago, and he had eye surgery. It didn't work out. He says, I haven't been doing anything for almost a year. I don't plan on doing anything for a year, and I owe pieces out there. I'm, I'm, I've even accepted money up front, and I'm trying to apologize to those people, but I can't 
seemed to get my art life back together. And so his pieces right away on a lot of galleries, they jumped up. They became very valuable because if he cannot make another piece, then those dolls are, are just basically more valuable and also more scarce. Uh, scarce. And um, most time that happens after the artist dies. But in this case, for him or anybody else, when they continue to work, then it goes down. But I, I want to, um, I know the time is getting kind of short. Um, I do have another talk, I think in a couple hours or so, but I just want to go through a, a few of these uh, items right here. And we did have some other pipe bags, other small bags, some things we have sold. So um, some, some of the pieces I really liked, I wanted to explain them, but I don't see them here. Yeah. <coughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Are these all Lakota Sioux now that are up there in the wall? Or? Well, um, almost. I would say like 90, 95 percent. This war shirt, our leader shirt and leggings <coughs> is made from a, a gentleman who's northern Cheyenne on, on that. But the uh, Lakota war shirt is not too much different other than the decoration but the beadwork pattern is, is about the same. I wanted to show you a, a, a bag here. And uh, in one way, it doesn't look all that impressive, but in a, uh, an authentic uh, look at it, it, it is. It's this leather, maybe you can see this better, is, it's a brain tan leather, but it's smoked. And that's another method of waterproofing this. Uh, bag right here and also it kind of seals certain uh, uh, fibers in here that are very essential to keeping this um, making it last a long time but the beadwork on this uh, these are old beads and even though they don't look old they're not aged or anything but they are old beads it's sinew sewn and so some of you might know what that means but on um, uh, we have a cover that protects our vertebrae um, us as humans and as animals, and you take off that sinew. We could pass that around. <coughs> you, you take off that sinew, and it's, it's maybe an inch or an inch and a half, depending on the animal, wide, and it, it could be like a foot to um, 18, 20 inches long. And what you do is you, you take off a little piece of that, like a thread, and then um, you run it through your mouth. This is how the kind of the women used to do it. You run it through the mouth. You kind of break down those fibers on it. And then you have, uh, in the beginning, it used to be uh, no needle at all. You just poked a hole, and then you ran through the thread. Later on, they came up with some, some uh, um, owls to, to use and then they would end up with a, a bone needle that would come out of the foot of a, uh, either a deer or a buffalo. And they would use that to sew. But the good thing about